Welcome to part two of lecture eight. So far in this lecture, we've seen what makes a good divergence function. And we've looked at batch norm as a way of improving model learning. Another very important problem in training neural network models is that of data under specification. In the illustrations I've shown you so far, I've presented somewhat of an unrealistically optimistic picture. As we recall, we try to learn the entire function from just a few snapshots of the input output relationships. To do this, we define a divergence between the actual uh, output of the network and the desired output of the network, and then estimate the network parameters to minimize the average divergence over the training instances. But this figure I've shown you isn't exactly how it will turn out. The network may just end up learning to predict the outputs at exactly the training inputs and be arbitrary elsewhere. So we may end up learning this red curve instead of the dashed line blue curve, which is the actual function that we want to learn, given only these training instances shown by these vertical red bars. And even this figure is wrong. The actual number of training instances will not be anything like what we have shown here. It will be far fewer. To get an idea of how few data we actually have, consider this example. Say we have a 100 dimensional input, which is actually fairly small. Your typical image, for instance, will have thousands or even millions of pixels. So this is a tiny input. Assume your inputs are binary. So uh, like a 10 cross 10 image where every pixel is either zero or one. So these are, this represents data in a hundred dimensional uh, binary space. And since there are hundred dimensions, there are two raised to hundred, which is about 10 raised to 30 possible inputs. And all of these inputs will reside on the corners of a hundred dimensional hypercube. In order to fully specify the function, we will have to specify the output values at each of these corners, at each of these 10 raised to 30 corners. Otherwise, the network cannot learn the function properly. Now imagine that we have 10 raised to 15 training instances. That's about 1000 trillion training instances. This is totally unrealistic. We never have anywhere close to that many training instances. Even with 1000 trillion training instances, we will still be off by a factor of 15 from fully specifying the function at all corners. We will have only have training instances for one out of 1000 trillion corners. It's basically the same as having no training data at all. To put this in context, if the edges of this hypercube were of finite length, and I randomly placed you on one of the corners of the hypercube in a tiny spaceship that traveled, traveled along the edge at say half the speed of light. And you traveled along the edge, edges of the cube in search of one of our training points. Life on earth would end long before you found your first training point. That's how sparse your training data are. This is even for a tiny problem with 100 dimensional binary inputs. With larger inputs, the problem would rapidly get much worse. And it is with such grossly underspecified training data that we try to learn the entire function. To make the problem even more stark with 1000 trillion training instances for this problem, we would have the, uh, which is a hundred dimensional problem, we would have the hundredth root of 10 raised to 15, or just a tiny amount over one training instance per dimension. And we are asking our network to learn the entire function everywhere from just this one effective training instance per dimension. Clearly this is absurd. So we need additional constraints on the model that will force it to fill in the missing regions of the uh, input space in a reasonable sort of way. Basically, we need constraints 
that will make the model generalize better in regions of the input space where we have not seen training data. To illustrate the why and how of these constraints, consider, consider the case of a simple binary classifier working on a scalar input. Assume a network with a sigmoid activation at the output. Now, as we saw in lecture three, the training data will typically be of this kind, uh, where the uh, zero class and the one class will not be clearly separated, but overlap in some regions, as shown by these red and blue dots. Ideally, we want the network output to be smooth, as shown by this blue curve, which would ideally give us the probability that y is one for any given x. However, this network is a universal approximator. It can learn pretty much any function. And if there are no other constraints, there's nothing stopping it from learning this purple curve instead, which also fits the training data. And in fact, actually fits the training data much better than the blue curve. Now, if I were to ask you which of these two curves, the blue curve or the purple curve, do you actually want the network to learn? You'd clearly think that the blue curve was the right thing in the sense that it captures what we want the model to compute, namely the a posteriori probability of uh, class one given the input. But this, you know, just simply training this network does uh, has uh, does not prevent it from learning this uh, purple curve instead because the loss function that we are trying to minimize simply tries to maximize the fit at these training instances. So what is it about the unconstrained model that enables the network to learn this undesired function here? This undesirable function actually has many sharp changes from zero to one and from one to zero in order to fit the training data. And the network can learn this function because the individual perceptrons in the network are capable of modeling such sharp changes in the output. Consider a single perceptron with a sigmoid activation. A sigmoid is a smooth curve that goes from zero to one, but the speed with which it rises to one can be made to increase arbitrarily simply by scaling up the weights. So for example, this figure shows two plots, one in which the weights have a norm of 0.5 and the other in which the weights have a norm of five. And as you can see, the sigmoid for the weights with the norm of 0.5 rises much more slowly than the sigmoid with the weights that have a norm of five. So if we train the network with this training data, the network can learn this function simply by scaling up the weights for the individual neurons such that they model these very steep changes in the output. Simply by increasing the weights, the uh, neurons can end up uh, outputting something that comes pretty close to a, a heavy side step function. And a combination of step functions here can give you this undesirable output. To prevent this from happening, we have to constrain the weights for each of the neurons to be low so that they are forced to learn the slower rising response rather than the steep one. And to achieve that, we will have to redefine our loss function a bit. Here's how we defined our loss originally. Our network is a function of all of the weights and all of the layers. I'm using the matrix notation over here. So each weight, each W here is the matrix of weights for one layer. The divergence between the actual and the desired outputs of the network is a function of all the network parameters. I've shown them here explicitly to show the dependence. The loss is the average divergence over the training set. And in conventional training, we try to find the weights that minimizes this loss.
when we want to additionally also impose the requirement that the learned weights must be small, we will add an additional second term to the loss, what is called a weight regularization. This is the sum of the squares of the weights in the network. We've uh, represented this as a Frobenius norm over here. Uh, this representation, WKF squared, is simply the sum of the squares of all of the entries in the matrix WK. And so this term here is the sum of the squares of all of the weights to all of the neurons in the kth layer, layer, this one. And this overall term is the sum of the squares of all of the weights in the network. And when we use this modified loss function, which includes the average divergence and the squared weights term, then the resulting estimate will not only minimize the divergence for the training samples, but also simultaneously try to keep the weights small. This factor lambda over here is a regularization parameter which decides the relative importance of keeping the weights small. If you increase lambda, it will assign greater importance to shrinking the weights. So to minimize this new loss function, we must compute the derivative of this modified loss for gradient descent. The derivative of the modified loss is the derivative of this divergence term plus the derivative of this regularization term. And the derivative of the regularization term with respect to any WK uh, is simply lambda times WK transpose. So uh, in batch mode, the uh, overall derivative with respect to any WK ends up being the average derivative of the divergences for all the training data plus lambda times W transpose. In the case of stochastic gradient descent, the uh, derivative is simply the derivative of the divergence for the uh, uh, individual training instance selected plus lambda times WK transpose. For a mini batch, this derivative is going to be the average uh, of the derivatives of all the instances in the mini batch plus lambda times WK transpose. And now we can just plug this derivative term into the standard gradient descent rule. So intuitively, this entire approach simultaneously tries to both minimize the divergence between the output of the network and the desired output, and also uh, to uh, keep these weight terms small uh, so that the uh, activation functions remain smooth and they don't permit very steep increases. So here is the modified pseudocode for mini batch updates with weight regularization. It is the same as the usual mini batch update code we saw earlier with one minor modification. The gradient that we now use to update the uh, parameters is a sum of this delta WK, which is the uh, gradient of just the average divergence on the mini batch, plus uh, lambda times the weight matrix itself. It turns out that we can also naturally get smoothness constraints from the structure of the network. For a given number of total parameters, deeper networks impose more smoothness constraints than shallow ones because each layer works on the already smooth surface output by the previous layer. So for example, in this network, uh, in this network, uh, we can, uh, if the uh, first layer learns this ugly red function, then the next layer works on the outputs of the first layer, which has already uh, smoothed, uh, which is already smoother than the input. So we expect that the, uh, uh, we expect that the second layer function will be smoother. And so also the third layer learns an even smoother function because it operates on the output of the second layer. So simply by rearranging the parameters of the network so that the net, uh, by favoring depth over breadth, you can get smoothness. Let's see this with a couple of examples. The first thing I'm, we must note 
is that minimal architectures are hard to train automatically. So here are two examples of decision boundaries we would like to learn. In each case, it's a binary classifier. We want the out output to be zero in the black regions and one in the white region. So zero here and one in this arrow. Now consider the slower one. We've seen here, this is just a, uh, a combination of two squares. So we know that this decision boundary can be obtained by having one subnet for the first square, which will require five neurons, a second subnet for the second square, which will require another five neurons, and then finally uh, an, a neuron, a perceptron that adds the outputs of the two subnets, so a total of 11 neurons. This one is going to need one subnet for this square, which is five neurons, one for this triangle, which is four neurons, and the final one to order the two. So the total network is only 11 neurons. But then if we sampled 1000 samples from this decision boundary, the way we do it is we randomly select data from this region. And if they fall in the black region, you also give them a label of zero. If they fall in the white region, you give it a label of one. And then you try, you, you construct a network with this minimal architecture with uh, the uh, uh, 10 neurons in this case and 11 neurons in this case, structured in exactly uh, uh, in the way that we just said with two subnets whose outputs are being combined. And then if we try to learn the parameters of this network, namely the weights and biases from these thousand sampled training points, then here are the actual decision boundaries it learns. Uh, the uh, you know, even though the network is exactly appropriate for these, for these decision boundaries, regardless of all of the training tricks that we could use, we could not learn uh, anything significantly better than this. These decision boundaries that are learned, name, meaning the parameters that it learns from the training data, generate these completely uh, useless decision boundaries. So these decision boundaries that are learned are no way representative of what we want to learn. So we actually need to train much larger networks. But if you train much larger networks, you can begin to learn reasonable functions. And here's where the smoothing effect of depth really shows up. In these examples, we've trained networks to produce this hexagonal decision boundary in one case, and this bear shaped boundary in the other case. In all cases, our network has 660 neurons. We've trained them with 1000 samples drawn from each of these two decision boundaries. In the first setting, the neurons are arranged in three layers of 220 neurons each. So both here and here. Here they're arranged in four layers of uh, 115 neurons for this one and this one. This is six layers of, uh, this is uh, 660 layers. So four, four layers of uh, 165 neurons. This is six layers of uh, uh, these, these two uh, have the network arranged as six layers of uh, uh, 110 neurons each. And in these two cases, they're arranged as 11 layers of 60 neurons each. And we observe that the shallower network, always the shallower the network, the worse the decision boundary. So with three layers, the decision boundary you learn is worse than what you get with four which is worse than what you get with six, you get the best decision boundary with 11 layers. And so, as you can see, depth implicitly imposes smoothness constraints. Now here, we are speaking of, uh, uh, of neurons rather than weights, but then uh, you, it's easy for easy enough for you to compute that this one, this, this network actually has fewer neurons, fewer weights, fewer parameters than this network. Nevertheless, because it has greater depth, it's able to learn a much cleaner decision boundary. So also this network with 11 layers, each of 16 neurons, has fewer parameters than this one with three layers of, uh, uh, three layers of 220 neurons each, and yet it learns a much better decision boundary. So depth imposes smoothness constraints, which really helps. And another way to get you know, better uh, training is obviously with 
uh, more data. So, so this figure to the bottom is when we train the six layer model with 10,000 training instances and it gets the decision decision boundary almost perfectly. So we also get this obvious result. The best way to smooth your model is to simply overwhelm it with data, but that's not a choice you will often have. Most often you're going to work in sparse data uh, situations where the amount of data that you have is, is, is very small compared to the dimensionality of your space. And in that situation, arranging for a fixed parameter budget, arranging those parameters as deeper networks is going to give you uh, smoother functions. And so the story so far, gradient descent can be sped up by incremental updates. Convergence can be improved by, by using smoothed updates. The cho choice of divergence affects both the learned network and the results. Covariate shift between training and tests may cause problems and may be handled by batch normalization. Data under specification can result in overfitted models and must be handled by regularization and more constrained, generally deeper network architectures. So uh, in addition to the above methods, a number of other regularization techniques have been proposed to improve the smoothness of the learned function, such as L1 regularization of the activation of the neurons and layers and adding noise to the input. In that context, possibly the most influential regularization method has been dropout. So let's look at dropout next. But first, let me digress briefly to a popular machine learning technique called bagging proposed by Leo Breiman. The idea here is to use the training data to build several classifiers and ensemble them. The way we train the classifier is by sampling the training data and each classifier is built on a different sample. Test instances are now classified using all of these classifiers and then we vote across the classifier outputs for the final uh, classification. So this figure shows the overall approach. Bagging is known to improve performance significantly over training a single classifier from the entire training data. So now let's return to our problem. Dropout is a training method where in each iteration for each input, we randomly turn off or drop out some of the neurons in the network with some probability one minus alpha. Alternately, you can say that you retain some of the neurons with probability alpha. So if we began with this network, as soon as we receive an input, we flip a virtual coin that has P heads alpha for each neuron. And if the coin turns up a tails, we switch off the neurons, effectively taking a uh, switch off the neuron, effectively taking it out of the computation. Practically speaking, the virtual coin will be a Bernoulli random number generator with P success equal to alpha. And we do this not just for the neurons in the network, we also do it for the components of the input. Consequently, the actual network that processes any input, maybe like this one, which has only a subset of the total neurons in the network, a fraction alpha of the total neurons in fact. And these operate on a subset of the input components. We won't actually explicitly remove the neurons. What we will do is to peg their outputs to zero. So they no longer contribute anything to the computations. So in this case, all the units in black, including input components, have been switched off by pegging them to zero. The key is that the specific set of units that are switched off will be different for different training inputs. We randomly select the inputs and the neurons to switch off afresh for each training input. So here, for instance, uh, the first training input may see this network. The second training input might see this one and the third network training input might see this one. 
So each of these inputs effectively sees a different network. In fact, even for the same input, we will have different switch off patterns and different iterations so that the same input will see different effective nets in each iteration. Now for each input, we only, when we perform back propagation, we only compute the derivatives uh, for the weights for edges that connect two neurons that are both switched on. We be, during back propagation, we effectively only work on the reduced network. And the gradients for all the remaining terms are set to zero. And we will update the parameters and the gradients computed, uh, update, update the parameters with the gradients computed in this manner. The, the statistical motivation that's generally offered to justify dropout is that it's some form of bagging. For a network with a total of n neurons, each of the neuron can be switched off or on. So uh, if, there are, if there are n neurons in all, plus the input, uh, then the total number of combinations of uh, patterns of switching on and off the neurons is two raised to n. And so the argument is that dropout samples over these two raised to n possible networks. The network seen by each input is one of these two raised to n possible networks. However, these two raised to n networks are not all independent, but share parameters. And the final network we learn effectively averages over all two raised to n possible networks. So we're getting the benefits of banging. There's also a second explanation for why dropout works. When we just train a network in the usual manner, there is no explicit constraint that forces each layer to actually learn something. So for instance, one of the layers might just learn to copy the output of the previous layer, uh, simply copy the output of the previous layer and pass it through unchanged as shown in this figure over here. This effectively loses a layer from the network and gives you an effective model with one lesser layer. By randomly switching off neurons, dropout ensures that the neurons don't learn such simple or even trivial relationships, but actually learn to recognize denser, more informative patterns. So here's how we would implement dropout. During the forward pass, we run a Bernoulli random number generator with success probability alpha to compute a mask. If the generator outputs a zero, the mask value becomes zero. Uh, and we're going to compute a mask for every neuron uh, there in the network. So if the generator becomes a zero, the mask value becomes zero. Otherwise, the mask is one. And then finally, we simply multiply the output of each neuron by its mask before moving on to the next layer. The only layer that doesn't get masked in this manner is the output layer because you want the complete classification. During the backward pass, we simply multiply the derivative with respect to each neuron by the mask value for the neuron, which was obtained during the forward pass. That is literally the only change to make in the backward pass. Keep in mind that switched off Y values uh, when you switch off a Y value during the forward pass, that is actually going to be zero. And so uh, neurons which have been switched off during the forward pass will simply multiply derivatives with a zero and, and therefore contribute nothing to the, derivative in the derivatives in the forward pass. So this procedure is guaranteed to actually come perform the back propagation only over the reduced network that you obtained after dropout. Dropout effectively trains two raised to n networks. So on test data, the bagged output is in principle, the ensemble average over all two raised to n networks. And is thus the statistical expectation of the output over all networks as shown in this equation. Here, E is the expectation operator and is the expectation over all two raised to n networks. Again, to remind you, two raised to n comes from the fact that if you have 
n neurons in your network and each of them could be either switched on or off then there are two raised to n possible networks that you can compose from this one network by dropout and so this expectation is over all to during inference time what we really want to do is to run the neuron input through all two raised to n networks and average their output so you basically we want to perform an expectation over all two raised to n outputs but then uh, this is not going to be feasible because for even small networks the total number of neurons will be very large and uh, taking an average over two raised to n networks is going to be uh, computationally infeasible or even impossible so this expectation cannot be computed instead we're going to use this following approximation where we say that the expectation of a network of activations is the same as the network of the expectation of activations now this is an approximation this is not mathematically valid it's it's not an equality it is an approximation we make it for so that uh, this computation can be made tra tractable and now the problem of computing expectations simply becomes that of computing the expectations of the outputs of the individual neurons over the entire ensemble of networks now if you look at what happens so so then we can just look at the individual neurons and not worry about the larger network now if you look at individual neurons each neuron actually has this following activation uh, d times sigma where d is the bernoulli variable that decides if the neuron is switched on or off it has a probability of success alpha so over the entire ensemble of two raised to n networks the expected output of the neuron is simply going to be alpha times sigma so during inference time during test time we will use the expected output of the neuron which consists simply of scaling the output of the neuron by alpha now there are a couple of different ways of implementing this the simplest way is to just multiply the output of each neuron by alpha which is the probability of keeping it on you do this during inference not during training because and you do it only during inference because this is the process of taking the expectation of the output of the neuron over all two raised to n uh two raised to n networks alternately uh, there are a, a couple of different ways of uh, thinking about this uh if we can one one way to do this is to take uh the output of each neuron and multiply by alpha or you can leave the neuron as it is and the neuron has many outgoing connections and we can simply multiply the outgoing connections by alpha so these two operations where you directly multiply the output of the neuron by alpha or you multiply the weights of the outgoing connections from the neuron by alpha the two are strictly equivalent and so what we can do is to simply after after having trained the network we can simply uh, scale all of the weights in the network by alpha and then during test time we're just going to be we'll just use the scaled weights alternately there's another approach during training we can replace the activity during training we can replace the activation of all neurons by alpha inverse sigma this doesn't affect the dropout procedure itself during training it doesn't it doesn't affect the uh, the logic of the back propagation uh, and so everything else remains the same but during inference during testing we will use sigma directly as the activation and we will not modify the weights so uh here is the pseudo code for testing with dropout models it's just the regular forward pass except the activations are multiplied by alpha alternately you could just have the regular regular uh, 
uh, pseudocode without even this alpha, but then during training, you would be multiplying every activation by alpha inverse. So here are some typical results comparing models with and without dropout. This is published by Nitish Srivastava in 2013. The x-axis shows training iterations. The y-axis shows classification error on MNIST test data. As you can see, including dropout in the training results in a large reduction of error in this model. So dropout is a really effective technique and they have naturally been proposed a large number of variations on this basic dropout idea. So zone out, which is proposed for RNNs, randomly chooses units to remain unchanged across time transitions. Drop connect drops individual connections between neurons rather than entire neurons. Shake out scales up the weight of randomly selected uh, edges. And so it fixes the remaining weights to a constant negative value. So the effective weight uh, during inference is going to be the scaled up version plus one minus alpha alpha times the uh, uh, the, uh, the scaled up version plus one minus alpha times this constant. Uh, restart. They have naturally been proposed a number of variations on the dropout idea. So zone out, which is proposed for RNNs, randomly chooses neurons and keeps them unchanged across time transitions. Drop connect drops individual connections between neurons instead of entire neurons. Shake out scales up the weight of randomly selected weights and it fixes the remaining weights to a negative constant. White out simply adds or multiplies weight dependent Gaussian noise to the signal, uh, to the, to the uh, signal going down each connection. And uh, they have been uh, other variants as well, which basically build on the same simple dropout idea. So here's the story so far. Gradient descent can be sped up by incremental updates. Convergence can be improved using smoothed updates. The choice of divergence affects both the learned network and the results. Covariate shift between training and test may cause problems and may be handled by batch norm. Data under specification can result in overfitted models and must be handled by regularization and more constrained network architectures. Dropout is a stochastic data or model erasure method that sometimes forces the network to learn more robust models. A number of other heuristics have also been, are also commonly used to improve the models. Early stopping is one. We track the performance uh, on some held out validation data and stop the training when the uh, performance on this validation data begins to get worse. So this can prevent overfitting to the training data. So here in this figure, we would stop training at about this point. Often the derivative of the loss will be too high. And this happens when the divergence has a steep slope at some point and it can prevent your learning from converging. So gradient clipping sets a ceiling on derivatives, typically at five. If the derivative exceeds the ceiling, then the derivative is simply pegged to the ceiling. In many problems, we won't have enough training data, so we can augment it with distortions of the data we do have, like rotating, stretching, uh, or, or adding noise to images such that the class of the image doesn't change after this, after this uh, uh, modification. And this new instance can be thought of as an additional training instance. We can do similar things for, for audio and other kinds of data as well, where you transform the data in a manner that, act, that actually retains its class and this transformed instance and the, and the corresponding class label can be added as a training instance. There are other tricks like normalizing the training data to be zero mean unit variance. Uh, the manner in which you initialize the net is important and many methods have been proposed 
like uh, Xavier initialization, climbing initialization, etc. You're going to encounter these in your homeworks. So here's the overall process for setting up a problem. You obtain the training data and you use appropriate representation for both inputs and outputs. You choose a network architecture, keeping in mind that more neurons need more data and deep networks give you better approximations but are harder to train. You'll see later why. Uh, we choose the appropriate divergence function and the appropriate regularizations. We choose a heuristics like batch norm, dropout, etc. We choose an optimization algorithm, e.g. Adam. We typically perform a grid search for hyperparameters, which we have learning rate, regularization parameter, and so on, on held out data. And then finally, we train. And during training, we evaluate periodically on validation data for early stopping if required. So in closing, in the series of lectures so far, we have outlined the process of training neural networks. We saw some history. We looked at a variety of algorithms, learned about gradient descent based techniques, how to use regularization for generalization, and saw a number of heuristics. But to make it all work so that you can confidently train your networks, you will need lots of practice and your homeworks will help with that. In the next series of lectures, we will move on to the next topic, convolutional neural networks. Thank you.